like now. Well, duh. I don't want to die in here. <laughs> yeah, you lose uh, each time. I'm gonna go over here, Karen. I'm gonna see what they look like. Mm, not too bad. <laughs> That's good. You got your dad in here. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. <coughs> <laughs> so, any any thoughts on why folks might have moved from the Mesa Top and built um, in these alcoves? Yeah. That's true. And, um, it is definitely a, a defensible spot, um, and that is one theory that archaeologists work with. Um, and there may have been another group um, coming in in the in that period in the 1200s um, that may have um, brought folks down into the into the alcoves as a more protected space. Um, any other thoughts? I think it's a more per permanent structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Protection from the elements. Yeah, protection from the elements. You've got the beautiful alcove cover. Um, it's just a natural protection. Um, more, cool more. It is cool down here. More room for crops up on the top. And more room for crops up on the top. Yeah. So it's definitely cooler down in the alcove, and we'll definitely we'll feel it a little bit more when we get into the main structure. Um, but warmer in the winter. And probably warmer in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, Water. It would provide more access or more farmland up top for crops, um, for more fields, and water. Um, so the alcoves were formed uh, by water. Um, the, so does anyone know what kind of rock we're standing near? Sandstone. sandstone. And sandstone, so sandstone is a very soft rock, very porous. Um, it collects or it absorbs a lot of the water that will um, touch it through rain or snow melt. Um, and then gravity over time pulls that water down. And once it hits a hard shale layer, uh, the water needs to find a way out. Um, it can't get through that, so it forces its <coughs> way out. And over years and years and years, it forms these alcove spaces. So these are um, wonderful natural spaces, natural protection. Um, they can definitely provide 
protection from elements or potentially um, enemy tribes or enemy groups or anything like that. Um, but even though they moved down here in the 1200s, they continued to farm on the mesa top. Um, so they're still gathering lots of, or getting all of their food from the mesa top primarily. Um, so they would climb up and down. Um, the primary access would have been from our exit route. Um, they used primarily hand and toe holes to get from the top to the bottom um, and to bring their goods down in. Um, so Cliff Palace itself has 150 rooms, um, 75 open spaces, and 21 kivas. So of those 150 rooms, um, we have evidence of fire in about 25 of them. Um, and so that indicates that about 25 of the rooms are really lived in, um, creating warmth, cooking fires, um, yeah, just general use. Um, so they estimate the population um, from 80 to 100, maybe up to 120 for this space, um, which seems a little low for the number of rooms that we have available here. But Cliff Palace is also thought to have been a community center. Um, so the Mesa Verde area has about 600 cliff dwellings oh, wow. um, in the area. Uh, so it was a pretty big community. Um, and so this could have been a trade center. Um, some people call this the, the New York of Mesa Verde. Um, not only is it immense and impressive, uh, it, could, it was also likely a trade center, a celebration center, um, or really a community center for not just those who live here, <coughs> but for much of Mesa Verde. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions right now? Yeah. I see this row of logs right there in that wall. Mm -hmm. Is there a room on the bottom floor of that? Oh, that's a good question. There, there might be. Oh. I, I'm not sure, I haven't seen the, uh, like a schematic of that, that particular space, but those logs would have been um, supports and they often indicate the layers between different floors in structures. What was the average size of the natives that lived here? Um, I believe the, the average the average height would have been about five feet, um, particularly for men, maybe a little shorter for women. Um, so it's definitely a different time, different diets, um, a different just a different lifestyle um, for the folks who lived in this in this site. Do they know how long it took to construct all of this? Um, so the construction dates here range between 1190 and 1280. So over about a 90 year period. Um, and those dates come from our tree ring dating, um, which we can talk a little bit about the next stock so we can actually see some of the, um, some of the logs that they used to help figure those dates out. And, uh, I don't know if there's a better place to see it, but you talked about how they came in and out of here. Mm -hmm. Like, where is that? So you'll see a little bit of that on our exit route. Okay. Um, in case I forget to tell you later, as we go to exit, if you're going, what, when you're on the stone steps, um, it's before you get to the first ladder, um, you'll see a little sort of egg-shaped crevice in the rock. Um, there's two of them right on top of each other. And those were part of a hand and toe route that would have taken um, the inhabitants had those who lived here in and out of the space. Um, and one of them is really cool. You can see some of the, you can see some finger marks still in the stone right there. Um, so the folks who, the, the ancestral Puebloans who lived here um, left in about 1300. Um, and then the site, it wasn't really unknown. Um, there were other groups in the area um, who knew about them, but it was, None of, it's not, there's no evidence that they, they lived here or inhabited the space. Um, but they, they knew it was here. Um, but it was largely left un, uninhabited until it was brought to Western attention. Um, in the 1880s, Durango and Mancus started growing up um, with a lot of cattle ranching. Um, and the couple of ranchers, the Wetherill brothers, um, Richard Wetherill, Wetherill and his brother-in-law Charlie Mason were out here 
in the winter of 1888. Um, they were here with a youth guide um, and they were grazing their cattle and their guide told them, well, while your cows are over here doing what they do, um, if you go around the corner here, you might see something interesting. So on a snowy December day, um, they came around and they were some of the first Westerners to really come upon Cliff Palace. Um, and it's, there's, there's, it's said that, I think Richard said, look at that palace in the cliff, which is how it got its name, but that may be a really poetic origin for the name. Um, <laughs> we're not quite sure of that, but it definitely is an apt description of it. Um, so as we head to our second stop, um, think about what it might have been like for the Wetherills to come and see this in 1888 and come across this amazing structure. Um, so we're gonna move down into the palace, into some shade as well. I forgot your um, name already. Oh Looks yeah, like he has a question. Oh, oh. Um, yeah, what's thank that you. symbol that, like, that says Kivia T? Oh, Kivia T. So, that is, um, after it was, um, after the Weatherills brought this to Western attention, there were several scientists who came through, and that was one of their, them doing a site study, um, and that was his marking system for numbering the kivas and um, <coughs> identifying each of the rooms um, for their structures so that we could know a little bit more about them. Any other questions right now? Okay. So I'll head down, and um, we're going to stop just past the, the little set of stone steps. for it, but I didn't want to carry it down here, climbing around. Um, which, yeah, it's sort of a, a, a 
community center, um, this community ceremonial, um, and there's also a living space. Um, and we'll, we'll actually get a closer look at one at our next stop. But we do have them, you'll see them as we go along um, through the structure up to our next, uh, up to the next phase. But um, they, are, they are prevalent here, um, which, is, which is a thought that it was a, a community center. We also have, um, I think we can see it for our <coughs> next stop. There's a, there is a cliff right across <coughs> the, the uh, canyon that I believe that one does not have its own kiva. Um, some of the alcoves are a little bit smaller. Um, so there's a thought that some of the smaller communities or like single family areas may have come over here um, for kiva, uh, <coughs> kiva use. Um, it's one theory for the immensity of this structure. Um, I would guess there are trails back and forth from one side to the other. Down the there may have been. Um, this one, I mean, when I look down into the, the canyon space from here, this one seems like it might be accessible from um, from below, but primary access would have been from the mesa top, as I understand it. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, and getting across these spaces. Um, Oh, yes. Yes, so the upper <coughs> level, I apologize, I usually mention this at the alcove when you can see it better. Um, but there's a, a row of rooms at the very top and sort of a, a second space. So those were primarily um, <coughs> storage spaces for, for food and grain. Um, those would have been really well protected from any rain <coughs> or snow getting in. Um, and then there, it was high up, so it's likely critters may not have been able to get there as easily. Um, so those would have been a major storage area. And it's likely that the number of rooms here were used for storage. So if there were around 100 people living in the, in the Cliff Palace, um, estimates put the need for, for grain at about, heard it as up to about 300 pounds of, per person per year. So if they're storing for the whole winter, um, Colorado winters can be long um, and cold, so they, they may have needed quite a bit of storage space uh, as well. Um, so if we look at some of the architecture, you can see they were using stand, sandstone blocks that were um, hand carved. Um, does anybody know what materials they would have used for tools? Stone, bone. And, and wood, yeah. So they would have gotten, um, they would have needed harder stone than sandstone. Um, so they would have gone down potentially to Mancus um, to get some shale or river rocks that they would have shaped into <coughs> axes um, and cutting stones. And um, they would have hand cut each of these stones. Um, the mortar was made using a combination of sandy soil, ash, and water. Um, and then a lot of these walls would have been plastered over and that would have been a similar um, mixture to what the mortar was. Um, you can see a little bit on this wall, but a little more prevalently if we look above where the beams come out, we have in the mortar, there's smaller stones in there. So those were called chinking stones, um, and those were used to create tighter joints um, or to help level the wall as well. Because um, you can see how even the walls are. Um, even now, coming up today. Um, so I did have a question earlier. Uh, well, everyone was coming down still, but some, there has been some reconstruction done um, on some of the walls. Um, one of our early uh, scientists who came in to study the site, Jesse Nussbaum, uh, he also later became a, um, one of the park superintendents. Uh, what he would do when he was rebuilding walls, he would take uh, materials that had fallen over, um, and he would reconstitute the mortar that had been used and use the exact same materials to rebuild. Um, so in some cases, we have a difficult time always telling exactly what is, and that was in about 1910, um, so sometimes we can't be difficult to tell what is new and what was That's original. Good. It is good. It was an amazing <laughs> technique. He used all the original materials. Um, we had, we had another gentleman by the name of Fuchs who came here on behalf of Smithsonian to do a study as well. Um, he did some reconstruction and stabilization, uh, but his favorite material was Portland cement, so you can usually tell what he does. <laughs> so, 
name of Gustav Nordenskold came. He was one of the first um, to do a site study, and he came in the 1890s. Um, he came at the request of the Ladies Cliff, Cliff Dwellers Association, uh, the Colorado Ladies Cliff Dwellers Association, um, which was run by some women out of Durango. Um, and he did a full site report, full sketches of Cliff Palace. Um, and he's one of the ones who numbered the kivas in the rooms. Um, and he, he's one of the first that really came in to, to do a, like, an archaeological study um, as well. Um, and he collected artifacts. Um, his collection, though, is currently at the National Museum of Sweden. Um, but it is held in a reputable organization and will be on display and cared for. Any questions here? Oh, I have a question. Yeah. Did there used to be like roofs on top of the kivas made of like uh, logs or vegetation? Yes, the kivas would have had full roofs. Um, and actually, the kivas are next stop, so oh. if we go up there, we it's a little. I'm more of a visual person, I think. Um, so we will um, we'll go through that as well.
six pilasters that rise up from the bench uh, were supports, and they would have taken beams and spread them between each of the pilasters. And then they would have gone in um, smaller circles, um, stretching beams between beams, um, to create what would look like kind of an upside down basket. Um, and they'd leave a hole in the middle. That would be for entry and exit. There'd be a ladder through there. Um, but then on top of the wooden roof, it would have been uh, backfilled and then covered with the same plaster that would have been on the floor. Um, so this would have been a fully usable courtyard space. Um, one description I've heard that I like is that as much living as went on inside of the kiva also went on on top. Um, and so within the kiva, we have our fire pit. Um, Next to that, we have a deflector wall. Um, behind that is our fresh air intake. Uh, so behind this, this partial stone wall here, we have a vent that would take in the fresh air. It would hit the deflector wall, so it wouldn't put the fire out, and then it would circulate around the room, and then it would that would help regulate the temperature in the bottom, and then it would also help push the smoke out. Um, we had a question earlier also about ceremonial use of kivas. Um, so they were partially ceremonial, but they were also used for daily living too. Um, people would cook in there, uh, sleep, especially in winter. Um, it could get, the Colorado winters I hear it gets below, to below 10 below out here sometimes. Um, so heating a, a stone structure above ground can be difficult, but this kiva would have been pretty well insulated inside, like below ground and on top. Um, so this would have retained heat quite a bit better in the dead of winter. So they may have used these also as, as winter homes. Um, so yeah, this was also a major space for community. Um, the community was really a central part of Pueblo and living. Um, it was, I mean, we can see it in there. They, they worked together to build these, these structures. They worked together to farm the fields and collect resources. Um, and it, it was definitely as much of a resource as finding food and water and shelter was the community itself. Um, when the Puebloans left this area, uh, they took what they could carry. They left a lot of items behind, so we had a lot of artifacts here. So we find grinding stones and pottery, um, and especially bigger or heavier items. But what they took with them was certainly their traditions, um, oral traditions, their knowledge of how to create pottery, how to create a kiva. Um, and using those techniques, they, they build up new communities. Um, the descendant population, today live in uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and Northern Texas. Um, these sites are still very important to their heritage and culture, um, and Puebloans do come here to visit Mesa Verde. Um, and they, they also work with the park. They're, they're kind enough to share their, their knowledge to help us understand some of uh, the uses of the kivas or the structures, um, some of the history of the community, um, so that we can share it with all of our visitors as well. So I think this is just a really special place. Um, Do we know if they traded? They did. Did we ever find any obsidian here? They did. Um, so they definitely were on a trade route. Um, I think it, it could have been part of the Chacoan. Uh, could have been, I mean, uh, traders could have come from any direction, I suppose. Um, but we definitely find obsidian and copper bells from Mex the modern Mexico. Um, and we find turquoise um, that wouldn't have been here. Um, <coughs> shells from the coast. Um, those would have all been ornamental. Uh, we also find some red pottery. Uh, so Puebloans made uh, corrugated and black and white pottery. But uh, we find some red pottery that was traded in. Uh, and it's likely that they traded out um, the, their pottery and then also uh, maybe some food stuff. Um, but there's definitely a trade route coming through this area. Why did they leave? So, there's a good question. Um, we had a couple, we think it was a, a combination of reasons. Um, 
One reason may have been that there was a drought. Um, in the 1200s, we had two droughts. Um, one was about 50 years in the early part of the century. Uh, the community mostly stayed in the area through that. Um, in the latter part of the century, there was a pretty severe 25-year drought. Um, we see that that definitely affected like game hunting. Um, in the mid end, we see a lot smaller animals being eaten um, and hunted, like um, more rabbits um, and squirrels, less deer um, in the area. We also think there may have been another group moving into the area. Um, there's some evidence for conflict in the region, uh, so that could have been uh, another competition, uh, an extra resource competition coming through. Um, and then it could be also a combination of those, and uh, migration is is kind of a, a part of Puebloan culture. Um, their uh, origin uh, story is about migrating into this world from a place of emergence, and it may have also been time to move to a new space. Didn't they uh, decimate the wood for fires uh, up on the top? They did use quite a bit of wood on top, and it's likely they um, cleared a lot of land, and they may have used fire to clear land for farming. Um, so it, it could have also been a, a resource. That they ran out of. Yeah, it could be that yeah. the trees were just <coughs> growing as quickly. Right. Question. How'd they get down there? Oh, I may have forgotten to say this. Um, I know I did last time. There was a ladder, so they would have left a hole in the roof um, in the middle, and there would have been a ladder that was their exit and entrance. Um, if I if I did have enemies, who do you think I would have been? I'm actually not sure. Um, I'd have to double check. There, there, you know, there, there were many native. Uh, New American groups in the area, um, and I, I can't, I'm not positive, so I'd want to double check before I told you which groups were moving into the area. In Could have been any one of them, to be honest. Do people only live in the Kivas, or do they live in these houses? They also lived in these houses, um, so we find some rooms that have evidence of fire, so they'll be soot stained. Um, so we believe they, they lived in those rooms, those were as well. Later structures, um, closer to the 11 and 1200. Um, the towers were coming into use. Um, they could have been storage. They could have been um, for signaling um, to other communities and communication. Um, but yeah, they were they were definitely coming into their, their own at this period. So more on the gross side, where would they have toilets? Um, <coughs> there's not really have evidence of like designated. <coughs> I noticed that the this window here is stained. Mm -hmm. None of the others are. Um, so this window, and this window does a lot of folks will look into it. Um, and that's from handprints and yeah. oils and from. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, okay. And in '91, you could go up and go inside that room. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. I was here then. And people, <laughs> and people were touching everything. And so since then, I'm glad that uh, yeah, it's being preserved. The, the handprint damage I talked about at the beginning. Um, thank you, thank you all for joining me on Cliff Palace and experiencing this wonderful place together. I apologize that we're out of time, so we're going to need to start making our way out. But if you have further questions, you can catch me at the trail up there as well. Um, thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoyed. Cliff Palace. Um, we'll start filing out. Um, we'll just follow this path up. It'll lead to some stone steps and then the ladder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>
you were able to go inside the room? Yeah, back in 91. How did you get in? There's a, there's a door right there on the other side. No, no worries. It's a very small one. You have to crouch low to get in. Like that, sort of like that. Yeah. Yeah. 